What's going on? Welcome back to No Cap Space. We have conference previews for you, and we have a special one today. We have Liv, aka Liv from Hoops on the former Bird app. Uh, Liv, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm Liv, also known as Liv for Hoops Online, and I am a former Division I basketball player. I played at Florida A&M, which is an HBCU. And for those of you who don't know, that's historically Black colleges or universities. And Liv for Hoops came about because I want to use my platform, my experience, my basketball knowledge um, to really promote, recognize, and bring more awareness and recognition to the current HBCU women's basketball field, all the talented players, coaches, the conferences, just do my part to make sure people know we are there, we are talented, and that it exists. Because a lot of people still don't know, which is crazy if you don't. But I just want to use my platform to highlight all the amazing talent that exists in HBCU women's basketball. And that's why we're here with no cap space, because some people don't know. But if you don't, we're going to get you caught up and get you right. We're going to talk MEAC and SWAC and, you know, a couple others, because for those that don't know, there's some HBCUs in different conferences. So we're going to get started with the MEAC. Um, we've had Mimi Wheeler on here from Norfolk State. They are the top dog. We're getting ready to share the bracket. All right. So number one, we got Norfolk State versus South Carolina State. At the four and five matchup, you have Coppin State versus Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, two and seven is Howard versus Morgan State. Three, North Carolina Central versus number six, Delaware State. So let's talk about the big dog, NSU. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, there was kind of a log jam at the end of the season, uh, you know, around mid, mid to late February, where NSU was only like one game ahead of uh, second place. And then there was like a four-way tie for second place. So what was NSU able mm -hmm. to do to pull ahead and really lock down that uh, number one seed? In my opinion, what really changed it was the loss that they experienced to Howard. I think, you know, mm -hmm. in the moment, they were just running their competition over. And then when they went to Howard and Howard was like, hold on, you still have to respect us. Not saying they did it, but Howard really showed up beat them by double figures on their home floor and was like, hey, now the, the playing field, it's even because you have one loss. And I really think for the players of the team, it really woke them up. Everyone knows that Norfolk has a one-two punch. That's so probably the best in the entire women's basketball field in Diamond Johnson, Mueller. And so I think that just woke them up. So they were like, whoa, whoa, we were not supposed to lose at all. Everyone was like, they're going to run through the conference. They're going to be undefeated. And then when, because Coppin earlier gave them a really close game, UMES gave them a really close game. And when Howard pulled it off, I think the players themselves were like, we're way too talented to allow this to happen again. And in that second half after that loss, they just went crazy. Like they were like, nope, we're back to running everyone over. And that's what they just ran their way to the number one seed. What's that Drake line? Uh, you told me I fell off. Ooh, I needed that. So, you know, yes, and that's exactly what they needed. <laughs> you know, light that fire in them. Let them know it ain't sweet around here. I am, you know, as a, exactly. Hampton, as a Hampton grad, I'm kind of, conflicted that Howard and NSU are going at it because Lord have mercy but you know you know good for them good for them we'll, we'll all right the feelings aside um so you know you mentioned Mimi you mentioned Diamond you know many familiar with our show are familiar with Diamond and she is a bucket so you know who, who could yes. be an x factor somebody that you know might not be as you know well known as those two I think Bryant who is one of their younger players is going to be huge for them and to be honest all of their role players um and I use that term lightly because they've had other players who have stepped up in other games and when you just look at stats that's where they fall um but their freshmen uh like DeBriah Clark and um even like Copeland can be very big to be honest, I don't even think it's just one player who adds it's whoever's hot that night. And that's just really who steps up for them. And that's what makes them even scarier is that they have that one, two punch, but then as the game progresses, you'll see other 
a random other player. They're not random to the team, but another player just step up and have a big, huge night to be that third person for them. They really take what the defense gives them. Um, but I really do like DB Clark of she's their freshman. She's had big games. She's oh, hit a game winning yeah. shot earlier in the season um, in non-conference. And so she's a player I would really like to see get consistent and push them over that edge to find their way through to the championship game. Okay. Cause we watched um, Coppin and SU on um, playback and that freshman, she does not play like a freshman. So, you know, this will be good to cut her teeth and, and really have mm -hmm. a you know, breakout moment for her. Uh, let's go to possible surprise underdogs, AKA dark horse, but underdog, you know, dark horse doesn't rhyme with big dog. So we go on with surprise. Right. Underdog. Who's a team that can sneak up on somebody? I honestly feel like Coppin State will mm. potentially be that team this year. They did fall to the four seed. Um, and as the season progressed, you saw them start to have some down moments. They were very up and down. They are they have a lot of transfers, a lot of transfers. They had a few injuries they were fighting through, and I feel like they dropped a few games that shouldn't have. But seeing how, and they all side of North State, but seeing how they've had, they have very talented players. They have a player who I believe will be defensive player of the year and Layla Lawrence, who is an exceptional post player and Faith Blackstone, who is just a phenomenal scoring. Uh, she's a big guard and she can get busy very fast. I do see them being able to really give give that the run for the money to get to the championship game just seeing that they have a very talented squad and they've been able to compete earlier in the season okay because in that copping game like it was pretty close for like the first half and then NSU you tell it was yeah and NSU came out and you know kind of made that third quarter run and that was all she wrote so you yes. know copping can put together that full game yeah I agree it could be it could be scary hours mm -hmm. so you know, going back to the bracket, what are some, you know, potential matchups you're excited about? What's maybe a first round matchup that people should keep their eye on that's exciting? Like, what, what are you seeing? So I definitely love the four or five matchup of Coppin State and UMES. Um, both teams have gone through um, very up and down moments where when we see them play great, they're great. But when they've been down, they're down. So I'm excited to see how they enter in that game because I think honestly either team if they come ready to play in the next round saying that Norfolk wins in that first matchup um they could really make that game extremely competitive so I definitely have my eye on that four or five game and then another game is I like the Howard and the they're against Morgan State um matchup because Morgan State, again, another team who has been up and down, but they have the play in order to really, you know, rebound the ball, push the tempo. And when they're when they're shooting the ball and they're hot, they are extremely hot. So I'm definitely like, ooh, is this going to be potential? Because Howard, they found their rhythm. And I know they ended off with a loss uh, against Norfolk entering the tournament, but they definitely – are finding their rhythm, but Morgan State can definitely play aggressive and physical in order to make that game pretty interesting. Okay, and then are there any, you know, just storylines we should be looking out for for any teams in the MEAC heading into the tournament? I really, so I guess everyone pays attention to Norfolk State and as they should, they're in, they've been in the mid-major top 25 for a majority of the season. They had that great run Last year where Don Staley talked about how they were they should have been seated higher than what they were seated. And so I think a lot of the attention falls on them of being like, OK, you guys have the one of the best one two punches in the entire country. So I think all eyes are on them right now of being like, can you can you finish this out and get to the tournament? Because everyone wants to see where they would be seated um, and finish out. But I definitely am keeping an eye on Howard. At they, if both teams get to the championship game, because I'm going to respect the other teams in the playing field, they are the only team to beat them. And so I definitely will keep an eye on Howard to see if they can really put together a string of runs. But 
I think everyone's eyes are on Norfolk of being like, let's get you guys to the tournament so you can hopefully be higher than a 15 seed and you can, you know, make some real noise in the NCAA tournament. Okay, because I covered that USC NSU game and I was tight because I was like any other seating in this team would have been um it could have been a potential upset because what was that guard from New York the senior? Ooh, what was her name? My mind's going blank. But you but know, I know who you're talking about. about. She, she yes. was cold and it, it, it oh goodness gracious yeah. So like, like on that same point. What do you feel like the MEAC has earned in terms of seeding this year when when they get their automatic bid? I definitely think it depends on the team because as we know, they're looking at the non-conference. They're looking at a mixture of things. Did you how did you play in your conference play when you played, you know, P P6 teams, when you played other conference teams? How did you compare? Do you have any quality wins? So I really believe if Norfolk State went state wins it out and gets to the NCAA tournament, they should be at least at minimum a 14 seed. They should not be 15 or 16. They are no way shape or form a play-in game whatsoever um I think the loss to Howard in the regular season may come back to bite them if they get to the NCAA tournament simply because they're like you shouldn't have lost and they're there's that may hinder them to in the eyes of the seeding committee but I do believe they are at minimum a 14 seed for any other team that makes it through and if another team does win I do see them being placed at a 15 six spot probably the 16 spot simply because the non-conference schedule for a lot of these teams was not as successful as Norfolk State and none of them ran the table they all have three plus losses in conference play and so unfortunately that's the way the NCA sees the MEAC is that you have to run through you have to have a, a successful non-conference season and so really in the teens but I'm really I selfishly as a basketball fan I want to see Norfolk get there to be that 13-14 seed so that we can really show that last year they should have been way higher yeah, and I'm about to defend Howard. To me, that <laughs> Howard law shouldn't hurt as much since Howard was the representative the year before facing South Carolina again. So, you know, you have a team that just went through the gauntlet and is now, you know, the top two seed in a conference that has faced that South Carolina team the last couple of years. So, you know, hopefully the committee gets it right. Sometimes they don't, you know, so mm -hmm. we'll we'll keep them lifted in prayer. Uh, <laughs> that they make we... the right decision exactly otherwise we riot at dawn if you're listening 100 um... <laughs> percent. so we're gonna go ahead and go into the um swack uh, the swack it's getting swack is back swack has been back yes. swack has been back <laughs> swack has been back. yes so on the women's side uh, you have Jackson State versus uh, Prairie View A&M. Then you have Arkansas Pine Bluff versus Alabama A&M. Grambling State versus Florida A&M. And then Southern versus Alcorn at that 3-6 to complete the bracket. So let's go ahead and talk about the big dog, Jackson State. Um, you know, our a lot of our viewers are familiar because I'm still not over it. They got robbed against LSU a couple years ago. They, they, Thank you. They were a few calls away from pulling off that upset, and mm -hmm. you know I, mm, I'm not gonna dwell on the past though. I'm not gonna dwell oh, on the we past. We will never forget it. We can, I will never forget it. Never forget. So let's start with the big dog, Jackson State. What have they done to get back to this position? So obviously, you know, when we're looking at their resume, they have a P6 win. They beat St. John's in their non-conference season, which was a great win for them. And although they didn't pick up any more notable wins, when you're looking at who they played, they were very competitive in those matchups. Taking Miami, who was just recently, you know, although they're not the same this year, right. um, they took them down to the wire. They played out in Oregon very well. So against these big P6 teams, they were extremely competitive. And then, as we know, 
if you don't know, you need to be familiar. They ran the table in conference play. They just finished the conference season 18 and 0. And I really want people to understand that no matter what conference you're in, that is extremely difficult to do. Going 18 and 0 undefeated in a conference season, and they were tested. Not all games were blowouts. There was many single digit wins where, you know, their veteranship, their leadership, it showed through in those final quarters of them being able to pull it out. They've been ranked in the mid-major top 25 for majority of the year. In the last one, they were just recently number 14. And for the first time ever in school history, they received an AP top 25 vote. So that is major and I think will go a long way if they can win out the tournament when it comes to seeding. Okay. And, you know, um, many of us got familiar with Amisha Williams holiday. So let's update our rosters in our yeah. mind and, you know, yes. look at who we should be looking at on this year's roster to, to make some things shake. So we for all started off with one of my favorite players is Maya Crump. She's a great two-way player. She uh, can really, she's been getting a lot of double doubles. She's a great defender, a great slasher scorer. She stands out a lot for that team. And then Angel Jackson, their post player, who she's just a force inside. There's been multiple games this season where she's had five plus blocks. She gets it done. She knows how to play her role, take what the defense is giving her. And then Bowler, who was preseason player of the year. Um, she can, when she gets going and those buckets start falling, it's going to come in a flood. And then the biggest one is a transfer advent who she can straight up light it up. She can light it up. And once that first three goes in, it's, it's, there's no stopping her. Hey, Liz, it's, it's an avalanche. <laughs> it, it really is. If that first one goes in, that other team is in trouble because she lets it fly. And I know she has the green light just by the way she shoots it. I'm like, oh my gosh, in transition. They're on a, a five on one and she's pulling up and shooting the three and it goes in. So, but Jackson State, what makes them very, has made them scary really this year is it's been not a single player every single game. They really have just been able to find where's the mismatch and let's expose that. Whether it's Angel Jackson one night, Maya Crump the next, Bowler the next, Avent, uh, Mahoney, Mahoney um, Luckett, they really just find can we expose on the other team and let's do it the entire game and make them pay for it. Okay. And then, you know, just as an aside, we know coach Tamika Reed, you know, she gets the clipboard clipping and she's going to put that, she's going to put on a fit. She's going to put it on. So uh, moving on to the possible surprise underdog, who, who do you have? I really think there's multiple and that's the crazy thing. For anyone who's not familiar, Jackson State did lose in the tournament last year to Southern, who is this year ranked um, the fourth seed. And I really think any of these games, there's a possibility that the other team can win. Even when I look at Jackson State and Prairie View, when they played their last matchup, it was down to the wire. Like Prairie View, everyone was tuned into that game. Like, what is happening? Prairie View had them down to the wire in a potential loss. And then when we go to the FAMU Grambling, Grambling did sweep them, but the first game went into three overtimes. The second one, it was just an ugly win, a battle the entire time. And then with Alabama A&M and UAPB, they split. And, and so I'm just like looking at the bracket. I'm like, literally, I think we're all looking like, oh, Jackson State should should be in the championship game but all of these matchups I'm like I could see seasons why either team hmm. could pull up the upset and get to the next round so like that log jam we saw <laughs> at two in the Mia it's everywhere in the sweat yes okay it really is okay that nah that's that's pretty dope so what are some um premier matchups for you So I love the matchup um, of Grambling and FAMU. FAMU has the leading scorer in WAC, Grizzle, Ariana Grizzle. And, but Grambling State has just been on an amazing season. They've 
They got 21 wins. They're in second place in the SWAC. The second time they played, they did find ways to stop her from scoring. But it was just, like I said, it was an ugly battle. And so I'm seeing that as just that game in itself is such a great matchup. And we will also have two first-year head coaches going at it to get mm. to the next round. So I'm really excited for that one um, because I just – the all the different matchups along the board just it intrigues me and i'm also extremely interested in the southern all corn game southern as we know they, they were uh, tournament champs last year and they've had multiple tournament championships but all corn has been playing their best basketball coming into the tournament their player their post player destiny brown is just a double double machine she's extremely dominant and I could see them being able to really attack the interior and, and walk away with a potential win. If this this specific season, I'm so interested to see what happens because so many teams split or the games were down to the wire and close. And as we know, it's really hard to beat a team three times. So I think everyone should be tuned in because I'm going to be like on the edge of my seat like, is it going to be a blowout or are we going to see a battle down to the wire again? So just seating wise, where do you feel like the SWAC stacks up? So when looking at the SWAC as a whole, it definitely needs to be noted that the top four seeds all have a P6 win, which is great. Uh, beating beating St. Joe's, uh, Texas State beat St. Joe's, Grantling beat Arizona State, Southern beat Oklahoma, and UAPB beat Arkansas. So all very notable non-conference mm -hmm. wins, which really changes the landscape when you're looking at the conference. And so if Jackson State makes it through, I definitely see them being like a 13 seed. I could see them making a push. I think them getting that AP top 25 vote really changes the game. Right. Because then you're like, wait, not only were they ranked in the mid major top 25, but they received a vote in the AP top mm -hmm. 25. Like that goes a long way when looking at, you know, what have they accomplished? Running the table at 18 and 0 stands for something. And so I could see them making a push for 13. Realistically, the way I know how the seating committee does things, I see them at, at 14. Um, but I, I myself see them at a 13 seed, maybe even making a push just because I know how talented they are for any other team that makes it through. I could see a possible, depending on who it is, it probably is going to be a 15, 16 seed just from, you know, the bracketologies I've seen. And just, you know, when the NCAA is looking at these HBCU conferences, it just holds in their eyes, like, oh, they have to run the table in order to get a higher seed. So if any of the teams that got a P6 win make it, I think that that could push them a little bit higher. But realistically, I see them in the high teens, maybe playing a playing game and possibly getting a 15-14 seed. But at Jackson State, I really do see them being a higher seed than the playing game because let's be – or just matching up against the number one seed. Like – so, you know, because we often argue about like, you know, certain conferences need more than one seed and should get that look. Is this a year where you think the MEAC or the SWAC deserve more than one seed? I really feel like the SWAC should. The fact that multiple teams had P6 wins, um, we have two teams that have over 20 plus wins with single digit losses. Also, the top four seeds are all above 500. I really feel like this year the SWAC women's basketball put, they were putting on, like they were giving us everything we wanted in games. And so I really feel like they deserve the conversation of being a two-bid conference because the output is matching what we want to see, which is two bids. <laughs> yeah. Well, Liv, we appreciate you taking time to share your knowledge with us. You, you, we gonna have you back because we are gonna have to talk some more. If, if, uh, you know, if the committee doesn't do what we want them to do and give us our seating, we gonna have to have a conversation. Right. So, you know, we thank you for joining us and tell them, tell the people where they can find you on the internet again. 
you can follow me at live for like F O R hoops, live for hoops. And that's across the board. That's all my handles and you can tap in with me. All right. And as always, stay tuned for more content from no cap space women's basketball because it's March. And it's about to get crazy. So stick along for the ride. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the action. Thank you all for joining us.